last month. When I talk about the law of karma, I gave you one important and difficult passage about karma. And that is, <coughs> I don't know whether you have the sheets still with you. <coughs> so that passage says, uh, Buddha uh, represented Buddha as saying, I do not teach the extinction of karmas that are willed, performed, and heaped up without their results having been experienced. And these results in this life or in the next life <coughs> or in the lives after next. And never do I teach making an end of suffering without the results of karmas that are willed, performed, and heaped up, having been experienced. <coughs> Bhante, the sentence is too long. Too long. Uh, you, you don't have the... I don't have the sheet with me. <laughs> okay. <coughs> now, what the Buddha said was, I do not teach the extinction of karmas that are willed, performed, and heaped up without their results having been experienced. That means there is no extinction of karma if its results are not experienced. And the results can be experienced in this life, or in the next life, or in the lives after next. <coughs> and Buddha continued saying, I do not teach making an end of suffering without the results of karmas having been experienced. Now that means <coughs> And there is no making an end of suffering if the results of karmas are not experienced. Now, at first reading, this passage seems strange. So the first sentence means <coughs> karmas uh, do not become extinct so long as uh, their results are not experienced. And they can be experienced in this life or in the next life or in the uh, lives after next. But according to the law of karma, <coughs> karma has become defunct. It's called defunct. If they do not give results, in in their uh, in their time of giving results. Now there are karmas that give results in this life, and there are another, uh, there is another um, that give uh, that gives results in the next life, immediate next life, and then there are karmas that give results in the lives after next until uh, one becomes an arahant and uh, passes away. Now, if a karma that must give results in this life does not give results because of uh, lack of favorable conditions, then it becomes defunct. The karma was done, but if that karma does not give results in this life, then it becomes defunct. It will not give results in next life or in future lives. And also the karma which is to give results in the next life. If it does not give results in the next life, 
then it becomes defunct. It will not give results in the lives after the next until uh, the end of samsara. And there are other karmas that give results um, beginning with the life after next life until the end of samsara for that person. And those karmas will not become defunct until uh, that person becomes an arahant and passes away or so long as there is samsara for him. Now the first karma <coughs> uh, that gives result in this life, this karma will not become extinct or defunct so long as it has not given results and so long as there is this life. But after this life, if it does not become, if it uh, does not give results, then it will become defunct. And the second type of karma that gives results in next life. So, so long as it has not given results in the next life and so long as the next life uh, exists, then that karma does not become defunct. But when its time of giving results is past, that means when a person is reborn in the third existence, then that second type of karma also becomes defunct. The third type of karma that gives results from the third existence to the end of samsara, it will not become defunct so long as there is uh, samsara for him. So, the, the commentary says that it is to show that you cannot escape the results of karma so long as you are in this samsara. <coughs> now, the second sentence that mm, there is no making an end of suffering without the results of karmas having been experienced. Here we are not to understand that if we have not experienced the results of all karmas, we, uh, we cannot make an end of suffering. We are not to take that way. Because if we take it that way, that we cannot make an end of suffering until we have experienced all results of karma. Actually, there would be no uh, making an end of suffering because we had uh, a lot of, a big amount of uh, karma accumulated uh, in the past. And if we are to experience all the, the results of the good and bad karmas, before we can make an end of suffering, there would be no making an end of suffering at all. So here I think what we should understand is we must have experienced the result of karma which we did in the past before uh, we can make an end of suffering, before we can become an arahant and uh, leave the samsara. Now every every mm, being has experienced the results of karma. There is no being who has not experienced the result of karma, either good or bad. So what this uh, sentence means, in my opinion, is that all of us experience the result of good or bad karma which we did in the past. And if we have not experienced uh, any results of the good or bad karma we did in the past, uh, there can be no uh, making an end of suffering. Let us take an example of uh, the Venerable Angulimala. Now, as you all know, uh, Venerable Angulimala was first 
a, a robber and he kills thousands of people and he was feared by all people and it is said that no one could escape uh, escape him but later Buddha uh, went to him met him and preached to him and he became uh, his disciple he threw away all his weapons and he followed the Buddha and later he became a monk he became a monk and then he practiced meditation and became an arahant. Now during his life as a robber, as he had killed thousands of people, he had all kinds of akusala gamma, those that will give result in, in that life and those that will give results in the next life and then and the li- uh, in the life after the next life. <laughs> But he became an arahant, and so those that will give result in the next life and those that will give result in the life after next could not do anything to him. <coughs> but those that that uh, give result in the present life, he suffered um, ill consequences of uh, that and those karmas. Now, since he was feared, even when he became a monk, people were afraid of him. And when people saw him, they went away and they, they closed their doors. And so he was, uh, he had difficulty in getting, uh, getting food enough for, uh, for him. And also it is said that sometimes a, a person may throw a stone, not to, not to him, but that stone would hit him, and so he he had a, a a broken head and so on. So he suffered the ill consequences or bad consequences of his karma, uh, which uh, which gave results in that present life. But with regard to the 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 results that uh, would be experienced in the next life and the life after next. Mm. these results uh, cannot cannot uh, come about because he gets out of <coughs> samsara after he died as an arahant. So in that case, Angulimala was able to make an end of suffering without experiencing the result of all of his karmas. But he did experience the, the painful results of uh, his karma uh, that could give results in the present life. <coughs> now, after understanding the law of karma in general, we will now study the divisions of karma. Now you have the sheets <coughs> and first karma is divided into two wholesome karma and unwholesome karma. But here the, the division is by way of function and so on. And I cannot explain in much detail uh, these different kinds of karma. So if you want to understand (coughs) uh, these karmas in detail, uh, please read the Comprehensive Guide to a Manual of Abhidhamma by uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi. That is the translation of the Abhidhamata Sangha or the Manual of Abhidhamma and also explanations given. So, <coughs> the Kama is grouped in four, in four groups and each group consisting of four Kamas. 
So the first group is by way of function, how, how uh, these karmas function. So uh, by way of function, there are four kinds of karma. And the first one is called productive karma. That means karma that produces results. And the second one is supportive karma. Now this karma does not produce any results itself, but it supports uh, the, the, the productive karma. And the third one is obstructive karma. Also, uh, this karma does not produce any, any results, but it, it, it interferes with or obstructs the, the results of the productive karma. And then the fourth kind of karma is destructive karma. <coughs> this karma <coughs> uh, destroys uh, the results of the productive karma. So according to the way of their functions, according to their functions, uh, karma are divided into these four. For example, the productive karma uh, makes a person born as a human being. So as a result of a productive karma, a person is born as a human being. And during his life, he, he enjoy uh, good health, prosperity, long life and so on. And that is the result of his supportive karma. If he is not healthy, if he is poor, if he does not live long, then it may be the obstructive karma operating. If that person dies mm, in an accident or dies abruptly of some disease, then it, it is said to be the destructive karma operating. So, a productive karma gives results uh, at the moment of conception as well as during life, and then supportive karma supports it, and the obstructive karma mm, obstructs it, and the destructive karma destroys the result of that productive karma. Now, karma is divided into four by order of giving results also. That is, these four types of karma give results in the order uh, given here. And the first of them is weighty karma. Weighty karma means powerful karma that has a priority in giving results. If it is a, 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 a wholesome karma, it is the jhana, uh, jhana wholesome karma. And if it is unwholesome, then it is uh, what is called the five uh, grave sins, that is killing one's own father, killing one's own mother, killing an arahant, mm, wounding the Buddha, and causing division in the Sangha, and also the fixed uh, wrong view, that means taking that there is no cause, no effect, and so on. So they are called uh, weighty karma. And the second kind of karma is death proximate karma. That means karma that a person does uh, immediately before his death. Although uh, that person may have done um, 
wholesome or unwholesome uh, deed habitually. But if uh, immediately before his death he does a wholesome karma or unwholesome karma, then that wholesome or unwholesome karma that he does uh, immediately before his death uh, has the priority to give results. That means priority over uh, the habitual karma or reserve karma. Habitual karma is karma that you do every day, that you do by habit. Uh, people do both uh, wholesome karma and un- unwholesome karma every day, and so they become habitual karma. And the last one is called reserve karma. That means uh, not included in the uh, in the three given above. So the last one is called reserve karma. If there are no weighty karma or death proximate karma or habitual karma, then the reserve, the, the reserve karma uh, gets chance to give results. So in order of giving results, uh, these are the four uh, kinds of karma. Now the third division of karma is by time of giving results. So they are also, there are also four of them. The first type is immediately effective karma. That means karma that give results in this life. And number two is subsequently effective karma. That means karma that give results in next life. And number three, indefinitely effective karma is that uh, which give results beginning with the life after next until the end of samsara. And the fourth is called defunct karma. Defunct karma is actually not a separate karma, but if immediately effective karma cannot give results in this life, then it becomes defunct. And if subsequently effective karma cannot give results uh, for lack of um, favorable conditions, uh, if it does, if, if if it cannot give results in the next life, then it becomes defunct. But the indefinitely effective karma can never become defunct until uh, the end of uh, samsara. So when the the first, the second, and the third do not give results. Uh, within the time of their giving results, then they become defunct karma. Now among these four, the number three, uh, indefinitely effective karma is the most uh, important for us because immediately effective karma may not give results in this life and subsequently effective karma may not give results in the next life and then they are gone. But indefinitely effective karma mm, follows us all through the samsara. <clears throat> and it is this indefinitely effective karma that mm, helps being who have fallen to uh, hell and other woeful states come up again and be reborn as human beings and as devas. So all, all of us, all beings, have a, a store of this indefinitely effective karma, and when the circumstances are favorable, we get the results of uh, this karma. The fourth division is by place of giving results. Now the first one is unwholesome karma, that give results in four woeful states and also in uh, sense sphere and material sphere <coughs> uh, beings. And the second is sense sphere wholesome karma. And 
it gives results in the sense sphere and also in material sphere and in material sphere. But the third, material sphere, wholesome karma, gives results only in material sphere. And fourth, in material sphere, wholesome karma gives results only in in material sphere uh, existences. Now, in order to understand that you, this, you have to understand uh, first the 31 planes of existence and then how uh, the, the each one of them uh, gives results. So you have to go to a bit of my book uh, to understand the details of uh, the the results uh, given by these four kinds of karmas. So I gave you these uh, divisions of karma just for your information and also arouse your curiosity <coughs> so that you want to understand more. So if you want to understand more, uh, you pick up the comprehensive guide and read it. Now we come to the division again, uh, which is of uh, practical application. Because when we understand uh, which are unwholesome karma and which are wholesome karma, then uh, we can avoid uh, what is wholesome and un- unwholesome karma, and we can uh, practice what is wholesome karma. <coughs> now the unwholesome karma is divided into ten kinds. Three uh, done by body, four by speech, and three uh, in mind only. So unwholesome karma uh, done by body or done through body is of three kinds. The first one is killing, the second stealing, and third sexual misconduct. Now killing means killing a living being. And killing a living being means killing a human being or an animal or even uh, the smallest insect. So anything which is called a living being is not to be killed or not to be deprived of life. And when a person kills any living being, then he is doing the unwholesome, unwholesome karma. And the second one is stealing. Stealing means taking anything that is not given by its owner. And sexual misconduct means misconduct in, in sexual matters. <coughs> so not not only adultery but other misconduct also is included here. And unwholesome karma done by speech is divided into four. And the first one is lying, so telling lies, telling uh, what is not true. And here uh, it is, it becomes a real unwholesome karma uh, only when uh, it is detrimental uh, to the welfare of those to whom uh, you, you tell a lie. And number two is slandering. That means um, backbiting with the intention of dividing uh, two people. And number three is harsh speech using strong language, abusive language and so on. And number four is frivolous talk. That means talking uh, nonsense, talking what is not conducive to uh, spiritual welfare. So these are called unwholesome karma by speech. And then there are three (coughs) unwholesome karma uh, done in mind only. And the first of them is covetousness. That means the desire to possess 
something that belongs to another person. Now, if you see something uh, in the possession of another person, and if you if you have the the, the greed that uh, you want you, you want to possess it yourself, then that is called covetousness. It is not just uh, not attachment to one's own uh, one's own property or others, but it is the what about that unfair desire uh, to to possess uh, a a property or whatever which belongs to another person. <coughs> and number two is ill will. That means hatred, <coughs> or the desire for other people uh, to come to harm, or uh, to be injured, or to die. And uh, number three is wrong view. That means taking that there is no karma, there is no result of karma, and so on. <coughs> and so these three are done not by, by body or by speech, but uh, only in one's mind, and so they are called three, and that arises through mind only. So these ten are unwholesome karmas. So when we know that these are unwholesome karma, we are to avoid them. Now, there is no drinking among these ten, intoxicants and others. But the, the, the commentaries explain that it should be uh, included in number three by body, uh, misconduct. <coughs> now, the Pali word for that number three is kamesu michachara. And kamesu means sensual things, not just sex sexual things. So, uh, drinking and taking intoxicants is a kind of misconduct concerning uh, sensual things, that is, taste. So, uh, drinking and, and taking intoxicants uh, is said to be included in uh, number three uh, done by the body. Now we come to wholesome karma. So there are ten, ten kinds of sense via wholesome karma, and there are two sets of them. So the first set is just the opposite of the ten kinds of unwholesome karma. So abstain, abstention from killing, from stealing, from sexual misconduct, abstention from lying, slandering, harsh speech, frivolous talk, and, as, and the, the, the third group is non-covetousness or non-greed. That means not co coveting uh, other people's uh, property, and non-ill will or non-hatred, that means uh, actually uh, loving kindness. <coughs> and the third one, right view or non-delusion, is is the, the view that there is uh, cause, there is effect, <coughs> and uh, everything in the world is dependent upon some other thing and so on. So these ten sense fear wholesome karma. These are the negative uh, side of sense fear wholesome karma. And there is another set of ten uh, sense fear wholesome karma that are on the positive side. <coughs> And so there are ten of them, and the first one is giving, dana. So making donations, <coughs> charity is giving. And the second one is virtue or moral purity. That means keeping one's moral conduct pure by abstention from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, and so on. The third one is mental culture, development of one's mind towards 
spiritual welfare or spiritual advancement. <coughs> The fourth is reverence, that means being respectful to, uh, to the elders and to those who are worthy of uh, our respect or um, greeting those people and giving seats to those people and so on. And then number five is service, that means doing and things for other people, uh, doing chores and so on, and helping uh, people in uh, in a in an act of meritorious deed. <coughs> and those who who donate labor uh, to the monastery are those who are ex- uh, who are practicing this uh, service. And number six is sharing of merit. That means first uh, you acquire merit yourself and then you share this merit with other, other beings. And sharing of merit is just letting them, other people, uh, get chance to get merit themselves uh, depending on your merit. So it is not giving away uh, your merit. And by sharing merit, your merit increases because sharing of merit is, uh, you see here, a, an act of wholesome karma or an act of merit itself. <coughs> and then rejoicing in others' merit. That means when merit is shared, then you say sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. That means good, 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 uh, you are happy uh, or glad at the other people doing merit. So when you rejoice at others' merit, yeah, you get merit yourself. Because when you when you rejoice, uh, your rejoice takes the other person's merit as an object, and so it is a, a wholesome mental state. Here, uh, the, the commentary says that whether the other person shares merit with you or not, uh, you can rejoice uh, in the merit of others. So if the if, if other person re- uh, shares merit, you can say sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Or if he does not share merit with you, but you see or you learn that the other person uh, does merit, then you can uh, practice rejoicing in others' merit uh, by being uh, glad at that merit. And number eight is hearing the Dhamma, listening to the Dhamma talks. And here, uh, learning, learning those, uh, learning some kind of um, arts or crafts or some kind of knowledge uh, which uh, does not conduce to harming or injuring others is also included here. Teaching the Dhamma, number nine. <coughs> here also uh, giving talks on Dhamma and so on, and also teaching uh, some kind of knowledge which does not conduce to uh, injuring others. Uh, which uh, which does not go against uh, the teachings of the Buddha. And number ten is straightening out one's views. That means having a correct view uh, concerning the, the cause and effect and so on. So this straightening of one's view is actually the opposite of the wrong view. <coughs> now, straightening of one's view is very important because if our views are not straight, our views are incorrect, then whatever we do will not uh, will not um, be kusala or mental uh, 
wholesome mental state. <coughs> that is why the straightening of one view is said to be very important and we need to have and the, the correct view or right view about uh, about cause, uh, about the effect, and about things that are related as cause and effect. <coughs> now the first three of them, dana, sila, and bhavana, are the three steps uh, to be followed by uh, the disciples of the Buddha. Now the first one, giving or dana. Among the ten perfections uh, practiced and fulfilled by bodhisattvas, dana comes first. So dana here means giving, helping other people, uh, making donations and so on. <coughs> dana is important because it makes our mind uh, pliant or soft and also if it gives us chance to practice uh, getting rid of attachment. So whatever we give, we not only give that that thing, but we also give up attachment to that thing. So by giving, we are practicing the, the uh, getting rid of attachment to that thing. <coughs> and the second one is sila, or moral purity, or it's called virtue. And it is control of our bodily and uh, bodily actions and speech. So, so long as we keep um, sila, we keep the precepts, we keep our more and more um, moral purity, then we do not uh, commit unwholesome actions by body and by speech. As laypersons, uh, you can keep five precepts and sometimes eight precepts like you do here. And if you want to, to practice more, you can take ten precepts. <coughs> and the third one, mental culture, is the practice of mm, samatha and vipassana meditation. <clears throat> By practice of samatha meditation, you get strong concentration, and if you are mm, successful with any one of the uh, 40 subjects of uh, samatha meditation, you get uh, psychic powers and all uh, and others. And by the practice of vipassana, uh, you uh, you ultimately uh, realize nibbana, or uh, you achieve eradication of all mental defilements. In number four and number five, reverence or being respectful to to others and doing service to others. These two can be included in number two of uh, moral purity. Because when you practice sila, you control your bodily, uh, bodily actions and speech. And reverence and service is a kind of um, controlling your bodily actions and verbal actions. So they can be included in sila or number two. And sharing of merit can be included in number one, dana. And rejoicing in others' merit is also included uh, in giving, because it is connected with giving. Not one's giving, but the other's giving. And then hearing the Dhamma, teaching the Dhamma, and straightening out one's view can be included in the third, mental culture. So... 
hearing the Dhamma is a, a, a kind of mental culture, teaching the Dhamma is a kind of mental culture because you are developing your mind and straightening out one's, views is, uh, one's view is also uh, a mental culture. So we can reduce all these ten into three see, if we include four and five in two, six and seven in one, and eight, nine and ten in number three. Now that we understand the unwholesome karma and wholesome karma, we can follow the teaching of the Buddha given in the Dhammapada. That is, not doing all evil, accomplishing what is wholesome, purifying one's mind. Uh, this is the teachings of the Buddha. Now, <coughs> I gave this translation very uh, literal, but it may not be good English, not doing all evil, because some, uh, when we want, uh, the Pali word is sabba, papasa, so sabba means all, and papa means evil, so all evil. But people said that if you say not doing all evil, that means you can do a little evil. <laughs> so uh, in good English you say not doing any evil, and not all evil. So not doing any evil, that means uh, refraining from doing akusala, <coughs> and wholesome karmas. And then accomplishing what is wholesome, that means cultivating uh, wholesome karma or the wholesome acts. And purifying one's mind. So uh, there are defilements or impurities in our minds and the purifying one's mind is also uh, the teachings of the Buddha. So uh, in this uh, verse, uh, or with this verse, Buddha admonishes us to avoid doing evil and to cultivate uh, what is wholesome and also to purify our minds. The Dhammapada commentary explains this verse as the first, the first foot, sabba papasa akarana, not doing all unwholesome deeds. Uh, that's uh, not difficult to understand. The second one is kusalasa upasampada, generating wholesome deeds and the development of what is generated. So here, accomplishing what is wholesome or cultivating what is wholesome means generating wholesome deeds and then doing these deeds again and again. So not just uh, doing wholesome ones, but doing it again and again so that it is developed. And also uh, the, the commentary says that it is, to, it is to be done from the renunciation to the arahatamala, that means to, to the uh, gaining of enlightenment. And I think that the commentary connects this to uh, the life of the Buddha. So, uh, as a prince, Buddha renounced the world and then uh, in, for six years in the forest he practiced austerities and then ultimately at the end of this, uh, at the end of six years, uh, he reached enlightenment. So from the, from the moment of his renunciation until he attains, uh, uh, the, the, uh, attained enlightenment, uh, Buddha generated uh, wholesome deeds and also uh, developed them. The third one, Sajita Priyodabnan, uh, means causing one's mind to be cleansed of the five mental hindrances. So there are said to be five mental hindrances, and you, as as meditators, are all <coughs> familiar with these five mental hindrances. So to uh, to clear one's mind of these five mental hindrances is also an important uh, act, because so long as the there are 
mental hindrances in our minds, we cannot 